joining me happily to say we are so excited to have you. Uh, it is really a happy moment for us uh, to welcome Her Majesty Queen Maxima, who has spared no effort to be a champion for financial inclusion, especially financial inclusion of women. Uh, she is uh, uh, a special advocate for inclusive finance for development for the Secretary General. By the way, he is also here at the World Bank right now. Uh, and uh, she has used her incredible star power to improve the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It gives me tremendous pleasure to give the floor to Her Majesty Queen Maxima uh, to talk to us as she always does with incredible clarity about the um, CBDCs and financial inclusion. What are the risks? What are the rewards? Ladies and gentlemen of the IMF and guests, please welcome Queen Maxima. Well, with such an introduction, I hope I do not uh, um, say something that is not uh, up below your expectations, Kristalina. Thank you so much for having me here, because it is a pleasure to be back with you in person at this year's annual meeting, finally in person. These are difficult times for people everywhere, and we're all seeking new ways to tackle the challenges before us, from COVID to conflict, to inflation, to climate change. In that context, the rise of inclusive finance offers a genuine good news story, finally some good news. Over the last decade, a quarter of the world's adult population has gained access to financial services. Today, 76% of adults globally are now in some way financially included. This has provided billions of people with new opportunities to build resilience, weather shocks, and invest in a more prosperous future. Today, we're here to discuss a potential new tool that many see as an opportunity to include, increase inclusion even further. Central banks around the world are considering whether to issue their own digital currencies or CBDCs, and are eager to understand the opportunities and risks that they might bring. If designed and implemented with inclusion in mind, CBDCs could offer many options to expand access to the underbanked and to serve the vulnerable and the poor. But they also pose new challenges and risks, which will require sound approaches to overcome. So I am encouraged that we are doing our homework and proceeding with a certain caution. Financial inclusion often starts, but does not end, with the ability to make and receive payments. As we know, traditional financial services create many roadblocks for the poor, such as high transaction fees, minimum account balances, or formal proof of identification. New, new digital financial services also face obstacles for the poor, such as low level of trust in digital systems, lack of smartphones, above, uh, certainly among certain groups, among other challenges. CBDCs could help provide the best of both worlds, encouraging providers to lower costs and broaden access, while also incorporating the advantages of central bank money such as safety, finality, liquidity, and integrity. CBDCs could also aid in upgrading the and connecting payment systems, both domestically and across borders, with all the benefits of having interoperable systems. 
Now, countries with limited financial infrastructure could also leapfrog directly to a CBDC arrangement, connecting to an inclusive, safe, and efficient payment system. But all these possible advantages are not a foregone conclusion. The implementation of any CBDCs would need to be accompanied by policy reforms and safeguards to address difficulties and risks. These include low level of financial and digital literacy and operational challenges, including cybersecurity. Policy reforms should also prevent disintermediation. That is the danger that money will be held in large amount in CBDC wallets rather than as deposits in commercial banks. That could make it unavailable for lending, for mortgages, or working capital for small entrepreneurs. A good design of CBDCs could actually give people more control of their transactional data and the ability to share it with a wider set of financial sector providers. Yet, growing concerns about data privacy would need to be addressed by hardwiring personal data protections into the structure of a CBDC. It is clear that more dialogue, research, and trials are needed to show how and when CBDCs can best become engines of financial inclusion. And more work is needed to understand the unique value addition vis-a-vis -vis existing payment systems, such as mobile money or real-time high-value digital payments. So how to proceed further? The Bank for International Settlements, the IMF, and the World Bank can help governments and certain banks to exchange knowledge and undertake research alongside academics such as those as the MIT Media Lab. Global platforms like the G20 and G7 can provide venues to develop common understanding and principles, and possibly even standards. Tech sprints, like the one run by the Indonesian G20 with the BIS Innovation Hub, give us a chance to see innovation, innovative private sector, use cases, and solutions. And the World Bank, the GIZ, and possibly other donors can mobilize the finance needed to test and assist in the design and implementation of CBDCs in emerging economies. By bringing partners together, we can build more understanding on how to balance design choices between privacy protection and transparency, and to ensure both financial inclusion and financial integrity, and of course, stability. If designed properly, CBDCs could hold great promise to support digital financial systems that work for everyone, but that is a very important if. So I sincerely look forward to today's discussion, and I thank you everyone for your commitment, and please do not forget the inclusion dimension of this conversation. Thank you very much. Well, you have been literally given a royal treatment on the topics of CBDC and financial inclusion. Um, I told Her Majesty when we were coming in that uh, after her, my job would be much easier. I would be, uh, I would have much less to say, and I was right. So uh, bear with me uh, on giving you an image and then outlining three priorities for CBDCs to help. Here is the image. We have been uh, talking this last couple of days of the difficult time we are in, that our world economy is like a ship in choppy waters. Well, the image we can add to it is thinking of CBDCs as being a new fleet of ships, specially designed to be agile and to be able to withstand a choppier sea. They take people on new voyages, 
they open up new possibilities. And because they're issued by central banks, they offer more confidence that the ships would move safely. Like cash, they're accessible for all. But as Her Majesty said, we have to step forward with caution. And here are the three points of caution I would add. First, that we need to recognize the demand side dynamics. Better understanding of local barriers for inclusion, better understanding of why some payment instruments are preferred and others are not. Our capacity development experts on financial inclusion often see strong preference for cash, even when viable electronic alternatives exist, like uh, uh, e-wallets, mobile money. Why are consumers not using these products? Is it lack of trust in the payment service providers? Is it a preference for informality? Is it difficulty to access services? Or it is that it costs a little bit more for people for whom every penny counts. We need to understand that so we can then make a proper um, information provision that covers for people how not using cash is better to protect yourself against crime and how if you use digital money you can graduate from payments to credit. And that, of course, enhances financial inclusion. Uh, secondly, we have to think of the supply side, the business models, and actually, Your, Your Majesty, you touched upon it, the incentive stru structures, the institutional setup, uh, so there can be a CBDC payment system that is worth the costs that it, it is going to uh, require. Uh, from training to onboarding to ensuring data and cy cyber security. Uh, last but not least, we do need to build it using lessons from existing payment systems. Like Indonesia, that pioneered interoperable technologies such as standardized QR code. At the fund, we have a very open mind. We want to learn from everybody. We want to offer a knowledge sharing platform so the world can move with caution, Your Majesty, but move uh, forward. Uh, so the ships can navigate to safe harbor and earn the trust of the passengers for their voyage. Uh, with this, I want to wish the panel a very interesting discussion that is worth a royal presence. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Gorgieva, for uh, launching this panel's ship, and certainly to Her Majesty for providing her insight and oversight for our panel today. Uh, I'm Kathleen Hayes. I'm your moderator. Uh, I'm Global Economics and Policy Editor of Bloomberg Television and Radio in New York City. Very happy to be here in Washington, IMF World Bank meetings. It's always so exciting and interesting. I tell people it's like being at a giant cocktail party where you see someone across the room and you go to say hi to them and you're on your way over and then you see somebody else and then you turn around that one's gone but you see another person. <laughs> And I feel this sense this year, being back here in person, everybody together, there's just an extra sense of what can I call it? Excitement, maybe a little bit of joy to see people and, and meet new people. So, and I'm, I, again, I'm, I'm truly 
honor to be here moderating this panel. It's a very, very important one with some knowledgeable and very interesting people. So uh, I want to start by introducing them, and they right in a row. Bo Lee, Deputy Managing Director at the IMF. Cecilia King Skingsley is the head at the BIS Innovation Lab, fascinating what they're doing, moving ahead all these issues of CBDC, fast payments, and inclusion. Vera Songwe, so much work in Africa to move these issues forward as well. Chair of the Liquidity and Sustainability Facility and co-chair of the high-level panel on climate finance for the UN. Perry Wargiro, uh, one of the countries moving ahead. They're not waiting for CBDC. They're drawing up the map and doing a whole lot more. Governor, Bank Indonesia, welcome to you all. Before we get started, we want you to hear some thoughts from the IMF Youth Fellowship Program. This is a very interesting group. It gives an opportunity to 30 young professionals from around the world. You have to make it through, be at the top of 4,000 applications. Uh, and the idea is they join this group, they want to be uh, part of global elf efforts, build forward better, and uh, joining the IMF at the forefront to respond to current crises and potential crises. So let's listen to them share their thoughts on digital payments and financial inclusion. In 10 years, payments will change towards a semblance of a cashless society. It will be a battle between cash and mobile money. I make most of my payments, most, literally all of my payments using my mobile phone. Historically, I use cash for transactions, but in recent times, I use digital payment platform for over 60% of my transactions. We must remember that more people have access to mobile phones than they do bank accounts in developing countries. I think a central bank digital payments app that prioritizes interoperability and accessibility can really leverage the uptake of mobile phones in low-income countries to drive financial inclusion. Invest a lot more in showing, rather than just telling, but showing the impact of financial inclusion and how that it extends beyond just having a transaction account. I believe strongly that this is the future of the financial sector and it's critical for that to be done. So what better way to get started uh, with, our, with our discussion here today? There's so many issues. And I want to start with you, Bo. Uh, you know, one of the things that Madame Gorgeva just mentioned was looking at the demand side, supply side. Uh, when I look, when I see these young people so eager, I think there's a lot of us older people, you know, whether we we need inclusion or not, in terms of our use of these things. There's a lot of a mistrust. There's a lot of doubt. But when you look at the demand side, that's the demand side, supply side barriers. Uh, what are the the ones when, when it comes to inclusion, in particular, that CBDC is potentially so well designed to address? Thank you, thank you, Kathleen, for that question. Um, the way we see it, uh, CBDC has the potential to break barriers to improve uh, financial inclusion, at least uh, in three aspects. The first aspect is that um, it can lower the hurdle for using money substantially for several groups. One group is uh, those people without bank account. And another group will be those people without smartphone, because CBDC does not even require smartphone. Actually, the third group that CBDC can potentially help is those people without internet access, without phone, because CBDC can be stored in a store value card. So these are the potential group of people that CBDC can help. The second aspect that CBDC can help improve financial inclusion is because of its legal tender status. Because CBDC is an obligation of central bank. And the obligation of central bank is a legal tender in every country. So it is widely accepted. That creates potential value for everyone to use it. And finally, the third way we think CBDC can improve financial inclusion 
is through what we call programmability. That is, CBDC can allow government agencies and private sector players to program, to create smart contract, to allow targeted policy functions. For example, welfare payment, for example, consumption coupon, for example, food stamp. By programming CBDC, those money can be precisely targeted for what kind of people can own and what kind of use this money can be utilized, for example, for food. So this potential programmability can help government agencies to precisely target their support to those people who need support. So that way can also improve financial inclusion. Of course, I want to end with a caveat because CBDC is not a panacea. CBDC cannot solve every challenge in financial inclusion. There are some aspects of financial inclusion is not related to technology. For example, financial literacy, digital literacy. So CBDC has to work with other policies together to try to improve financial inclusion. I stop here. Thank well, you. Vera, this is a good place for you to follow up because 1.4 billion adults uh, in the world, 24% remain unbanked. And again, this is something you worked on so many issues in your years of work in Africa, uh, and this is among them. Uh, and when you think of what the blockades are, because there's gotta be demand, right? Obviously demand people who don't even have a bank account are certainly gonna be eager to take, involve themselves in these systems, but there are things that, despite how much they want it, maybe they can't get it or can't do it. Yes, no, um, thank you, and first of all, uh, thanks to the IMF, uh, Christalina, Queen Maxima, for uh, uh, putting this conversation on the table. I think um, three things in central bank digital currencies. Yes, we all know, and uh, Queen Maxima said 70% more people are now banked, but to be banked is one thing, to have access to your resources is another, to have access to your resources in a timely fashion is an even more important point. And if you think about somebody in rural Rwanda who is sick and needs resources transferred very quickly to them from somebody in Kigali, normally in the normal banking system, you need to wait two days to get access to those resources. With central bank digital currencies, you could have it immediately and you could use it immediately. That's one thing. So it makes inclusion faster and it actually spreads it. And so that's one of the most important things I think that you get. And on the African continent, for example, we have now the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Christina, Christina made mention the fact that there are all these boats in choppy waters. We know that with the crisis and COVID, one of the things that we have faced is supply chain disruptions. Part of the supply chain disruptions are because of payment systems and settlement systems that cannot clear because each small holder a trader is demanding so little that there is not enough payment systems to feed into those processes. And so what you need is when you have central bank digital systems, you can actually agglomerate that and clear them much faster and much quicker. So it makes small business owners access their commodities much faster. They don't have to wait two or three weeks to have enough demand to be able to supply. You can continuously supply and make that happen. So that's another I think very important financial inclusion point. And finally, as uh, was said, it is backed by the central bank. And so one of the most important things of any currency is that you should have trust in it. One, we need price stability and then we need confidence and trust in the currency that we're using. And I think the fact that it's backed by central banks with the regulatory robustness that is needed, particularly today, is quite important. And I think the reaction from the central banking world is mixed, isn't it? Uh, some people are, are running towards it, some are more cautious, and so we're now going to get two central banking voices in here, and, and that's not you first, that's a sit. You are the, the main central banker here, but Cecilia, you're at the BIS Innovation Hub now, that's as a recent job, but you were the, the Swedish central bank. So you, can, you have that central banker kind of skepticism and how is this going to work? And a lot of it has to do with 
complementary policies. And that strikes me as a very bland way to say, there's a lot of complicated stuff to figure out here. <laughs> so what's on your list? I come from the oldest central bank in the there world. There you go. <laughs> yes, uh, the Riks Bank. And uh, uh, we, we started to look at this um, a couple of years back because we saw the very rapid change out going out of cash into digital payments. And we were sort of agnostic about that, but uh, we thought, okay, so how do we meet poly public policy objectives in a, in, a, in a future where cash no longer works? Uh, so it, it's really great to be able to work with these issues now on a, on a global scale, so I'm happy to be here. So money is a fantastic invention that has been created by mankind to make economic values portable. Uh, but mankind has also struggled over history uh, how to arrange money systems, and we have learned many times the hard way that uh, if only the private sector is doing it, it doesn't end well. And for the best part of 100, 200 years, we have this structure where we have central banks sitting at the core of the monetary system, but we have most of all uh, private entities kind of handling uh, mm -hmm. the products. Um, and as technology moves, we have left shells and gold and, and uh, copper coins and the likes behind us. Uh, and we're now slowly getting out of notes and physical money altogether and into the digital world. So it makes a lot of sense, I think, that central banks go out on this journey and thinking about, all right, so technology flips, um, the, the uh, um, uh, appetite for doing this in new forms is rising. How do we make sure it is safe and efficient and inclusive? Um, so it's only when these objectives are fulfilled that people will actually trust money uh, and the payment systems. So as has already been touched upon, uh, uh, introducing a CBDC into a society is not just a, a universal solution. It has to come in a package. Uh, so digital literacy, understanding what it means to have, first of all, have access to a digital ID and understanding what it means to to use such a thing. I think also this digital society is raising a lot of questions about uh, uh, data privacy. Uh, I think we're, uh, this is not only about money, but in, in so many different ways. And, and it's up to the politicians to really decide on this. This is not a role for me as a central banker, but having a possibility to actually choose how much digital footprints you want to leave, I think is a, is a good starting point. Um, so, um, as I said, it's not a universal solution, uh, but it can certainly be used and needs to go in package with uh, support awareness and generally when it comes to digital technologies. Um, and I think here the private sector and the public sector has to uh, walk hand in hand. There is so much more that kind of uh, unites us in right. these interests rather than we are, are on separate uh, levels. And I think also to get this working, and certainly in emerging market economies, it has to be combined with investments in network infrastructures right. and broadbands and the likes. Okay. And I think what, what the central banks or the public sector can do is to build open systems, create okay. level playing fields, but make sure that it is the private sector who who, uh, who are doing right. the innovation. And let me just start stop by saying that I think we need to be a little bit bold here right. in the sense that uh, we shouldn't get in the way of the private sector, but I think sometimes in history you have to push society into new right. equilibriums. Predecessors okay. did that when it came to building electricity, sewage okay. system and the likes, it's hugely well for enhancing. Now we want to do it again in money uh, and it would be good for banks as right. well when society takes these steps. Well, speaking about just moving ahead and not hesitating, uh, that's why we waited to get you right here to answer this question and to, br to bring this to the table because you're actually doing it, Governor Barry Wargeo. You're not, you're moving ahead on many, many fronts. I know you're working in close partnership with Cecilia, uh, but trust, I believe Queen Maxima mentioned that in her remarks. and. Uh, there's all different kinds of trust. You don't want the tax collector to look over your shoulder. You might be worried about being hacked. There's so many things. So what are, what are the issues there that need to be dealt with? And so far, as you design your model for your CBDC, it's going to take a while maybe, but how are you dealing with that? Uh, 
thank you, Catherine, for uh, this question. Before I do on that, let me thank the two ladies in the world that the heart <laughs> always financial inclusion, including Indonesia. Queen Maxima, thank you for always putting heart on Indonesia. Also, MD Kristalina, financing <laughs> inclusion. Yes, here, here. Every time I heard financial inclusion, I always remember two woman and my late mother. Why you do that? Two thirds of 65 or 5 million SME in Indonesia is driven by woman. So if we progress on the inclusion, woman empowerment, the welfare of the family, as well as the leaders of every country, including myself, my late mothers, SME, even not passing elementary school. Thank you, Queen Maxima and MD Krista, always putting financial inclusion in Indonesia. Three key words for social trust. D, E, F. Clear. One, D. Digitalization. What we mean by digitalization? Not always straight to the CBDC. Digital payment system. Use your QR. Use your fast payment. Very cheap. And then by also design the proper CBDC. Digitization of payment system and then CBDC is the key, one of the trust. E, empowerment. Those SME need to be empowered on how they do the economic activity. SME, yeah. entrepreneurship, marketing, product development, yeah. empowerment. F, financial literacy and customer protection. This is very important. To protect them, to teach them to be digitalized. That's the heart of Indonesia G20 presidency. Two of the six priority agenda on the finance track under Indonesia presidency is on the digitalization. One, advancing the cross-border digitalization of the payment system and designing the CBDC. Working closely, BIS, IMF, you know, on the cross-border payment system. And we are making progress of that because the digital of the payment system advancing with the correct program uh, performance indicator that toward digitization of the payment system. Indonesia, 20 million of our SME already digitalized, SME using QR, fast payment, very cheap, very fast growing. We are also advancing to ASEAN 5, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, as well as Philippines will be cross-border connectivity on the digital payment system, fast growing, financial inclusion. While under G20, we are working closely on the proper design of CBDC. We will talk with the wholesale, retail, choice of platform, technology on the correct design of CDCC. Second agenda is harnessing digitization for financial inclusion. Thank you, Queen Maxima, for always putting heart on global partnership of financial inclusion. We put digital uh, on the financial inclusion. So many model bases in the world from Indonesia, from India, from Mexico, from Latin America, from Africa, that model business of this digitalization let me is working. Let for closely. a very specific example, though, of what you're doing about trust. Because everything you said, you're moving in the right direction, but is there any in particular about that trust aspect that you think needs to be looked at? Any, do you have any specific sense with your team of what's the most important way? As you've all said, if a central bank backs it, great. But a lot of people don't pay that much attention to their central bank, right? But they do pay attention to these other things. So just, you know, in a nutshell, one thing, one thing that needs to be there. Always proper design or model business and as well as financial literacy and customer process. Because trust, if you know the product, if you benefit those 
proper design, model business, as okay. well as financial literacy and customer protection. Then the trust. The lack of the trust because those SME not being okay. enough protected by financial literacy and customer protection. Okay. So let's go from trust and financial literacy, very important, to data, to numbers, right? And Bo, that's where I want to bring you in because uh, how does the, is there data that is going to help Governor Wargio help central banks and other entities around the world look at what's going on, how they get this done and get it done right? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, indeed, uh, data is something we look very closely right now in terms of how to make this uh, CBDC ecosystem uh, attractive option for private sector participants. Um, for any CBDC ecosystem to be to work, we think we need public-private partnership. That is, central bank will issue the obligation, but we have to rely on private sector to innovate, to distribute, to serve the population. So we think a successful CBDC ecosystem has to be built on a PPP, right? Public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. Now the question comes, how to make this ecosystem attractive to private sector players. That's a challenge. Because if you think about it, how to make this a profitable business for private players? And we have seen this challenge in many of our member countries. And one idea we have, in fact, several of our members are also experimenting, is data. Because digital payment generates a lot of data. And this data can be very valuable. But of course, in order to make data generated by CBDC transactions to be valuable, central banks have to answer several questions. Question number one, how to distribute such data to service providers in a fair and equitable fashion that will promote healthy competition among service providers. Question number two, how to protect data privacy? Because if you don't protect data privacy, you're gonna lose trust, right? That's what Kathleen said about trust. You need to protect data privacy. Question number three, how to encourage innovation to unleash the value within those data. Because those data can be used in creating a lot of useful financial products, including credit underwriting and other value added services. But we have to make sure those service providers who want to perform such kind of service, they have to be properly licensed and regulated. So all these questions have to be explored. And we are doing that right now. We are working with a number of our member countries to explore the utilization of data in this process so we can create value and we can make it a sustainable business model for private sector participants in this ecosystem. I'll stop here, thank you. Bo, just a quick question. When you look out at, at what's happening so far in this sphere, mm -hmm. uh, do you see any ways in which, you know, the transaction data is so helpful are being used now or, or could be used or should be put into a plan? Just any specific example. Well, I can give you one example in China because I personally experienced it, right? Those transaction data can be utilized by service providers in credit underwriting in the sense that, you know, those transaction data in terms of how many coffee I drink every day, where I buy coffee, do I use uh, Uber every day, and what kind of working hours I have. Those non-traditional data can be very useful for financial service providers okay. 
to give me a credit score. And based on that credit score, the financial service provider give me a credit line without any face-to-face -face due diligence. That's a big saving because traditionally, you know, banks, they need to do due diligence. They need to meet with us face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. They need to even visit my home if you want to give me a home equity loan, right? Uh -huh. So there's a lot of cost associated with traditional credit underwriting. But the non-traditional credit underwriting is based on data. And there is no need for face-to-face -face meeting. And okay. it's much faster and much cheaper. And that's a way to create value. And we see a lot of that already in China because we have very good mobile payment system in China. And those service providers they are providing a lot of additional financial service in addition to payment. Right. And that can be very profitable. And that's the value we are talking about to make it yeah. attractive to private sector players to join this ecosystem. Sure. Well, and for the regular person, I, mean, I, think this is, I think this is global, universal. Anybody trying to buy a house or sell a house, and when you have to go through all those steps, anything that expedites that on both sides, right? on the, uh, I'm the user of it, or I'm the seller of it, this is very, very important. Uh, want to bring you in, Cecilia, on the question of, again, when you say, we say incentivize the private sector. Now, to me, again, that's a very nice, simple phrase, but let's, when, when you read about CBDCs, doesn't, one of the things that always comes up in a journalist story is all the pluses, but then, well, you know what it's going to mean for the banks. What if everybody goes into CBDCs and they pull their deposits out of the bank? And boy, oh boy, that could be a problem with the banking system. So incentivizing, but, yeah, but sometimes you get the feeling the private sector is maybe just hunkering down and wondering what's going to happen to them. Uh, how, so how, in that kind of environment, how do you incentivize? So uh, I, I think uh, what we just heard from Bo about uh, credit scoring uh, uh, is a very good example, I think, of uh, that different countries has to uh, take different journeys to uh, a, a new kind of world where they serve their society in the best possible way in the, in the digital space. Uh, other countries might kind of find this uh, uh, not the way to go forward. So we all have different preferences and and this uh, preference on, on privacy or anonymity is um, is tricky. Uh, a lot of people I meet and I've spoken about this for years now says that they don't want to have their payments uh, um, kind of distributed among commerce, but they're very happy to have a lot of CCTV cameras because they find it's worth to give up a little bit of privacy to get security. Etc. So I think the uh, bottom line is every country has to, to, to look into this from their own particular sp perspective. What, what is the current state? Where do they want to move it? Uh, and it differs very much if you were working in an emerging economy versus um, um, an advanced economy and depending also how financially included people actually are. So look at the current situation, look at where you want to go and ask yourself a number of questions. And, Asking those questions, I think, should be in a, in a broader conversation in society. So, legislature has to come in, uh, consumers groups, merchants group. Uh, so, so you kind of bring out the best of, of the best in, in thinking. And then, um, there is no kind of easy, quick way to uh, incentivize the, the private sector here. It, 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 it depends a lot. Uh, but I, I think I, I, I have a good example of how a private sector actually won from, from uh, the public sector moving uh, the country from one place to another. That is the Brazilian retail fast payment system, PIX. That was kind of a bit roughly kind of introduced by, by the central bank. Um, and it was a phenomenal uh, onboarding and people who had never had a bank account before got on board and uh, people could, could start to transact with one another uh, much safer than using cash and also they could leave this digital imprint so the banks could start to tailor make uh, selling credit products so everybody gained really from that all right this is might be a too glossy picture but but it kind of points out that if 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 the public sector kind of pushes the private sector into a new equilibrium uh, that that is something what is required if you're waiting for the private sector to to act you, they might be too much vested interest and they might, might be stuck there. Um, so I'll stop there.
All right. That means I can move on to Vera. Uh, and another really big issue, uh, and again, I think for people who are very much deep in the weeds here and just people talking about it, wondering about it, is financial integrity, it's money laundering, it's a financial crime. Uh, you, you have to set up the system so that you counter that. You don't let it happen as much as you can. And it, it happens in any kind of monetary system. But at the same time, you don't want to make the barriers so tight, I guess, that people can't get in. How do you view that? And how do you view the best way forward as these systems develop? I think that's a very good question. If you think about it on the continent, we're over 50 countries. And we're all trading with each other. Most of our trade goes from country A to New York and then to country B on the continent. It's very difficult to find trades that go from South Africa to Angola or Zambia to, to in, because the currencies are different, but also because we're trying to standardize the currency either in dollars first. But part of that then means that the know your client requirements are a lot more stringent and a lot more difficult. However, there is a very good example that's happening right now between Thailand and Hong Kong, where they're already working on CBDCs and testing out, you know, on one of the more active trade highways, how can we actually make that work? That's an experiment that's happening as we speak. And on the continent, we are looking at it to say, not only does it reduce cost, because first of all, we don't have to go to city and pay the additional uh, uh, transactions cost, it reduces time, but it also helps with some of this information and data that you spoke about in terms of the integrity of the data, the transparency of the data. And so I think that one of the things that the CBDCs can do well, and we are all watching the Thailand, Hong Kong example, I think uh, uh, you know well about it, to see really how you know, it's going to pan out, and maybe that will be something that on the continent, we work with the IMF, the BIS, and many others to see how we can, at least for the bigger, larger trading blocks on the continent, put that in place. And again, as you said, I think it will take away, we also have the issue of correspondent banking. And correspondent banking has been a very, very difficult problem for us since 2008, because once there, was, once there is any kind of uh, semblance of malfeasance in a banking system, you know, then you get correspondent banks shut down, which means that there are no letters of credit for small businesses, people don't have access uh, to, to capital for trade. A lot of the trade that is done in the developed world is essentially, you know, rollover trading. You buy, you sell, you get more resources. And when you have the correspondent banks closing because of issues of integrity or lack of uh, knowledge and you know your client, it becomes much more difficult. We believe that with central bank digital currencies, some of these issues, we hope, with the right legislation, as you've said, and with better d data management, we'll take some of that away. You've been shaking your head adamantly, Governor Orgio, on, on Vera's comments. So when it comes to this aspect of how you make it just tight enough to keep everybody on the straight and narrow and just loose enough to, again, let people in the door, what is your, what is your view so far, again, as you and your team are working very hard to get a, a specific outline design plan out for a CBDC, potentially by the end of the year? There is the choice of design of CBDC. Of course, like Mr. Bowley says, public partnership. CBDC issued by Central Bank. But how to issue, there's two ways. Whether wholesaler, which is mm -hmm. Central Bank will choose a big players, national payment industries, and issue to them, and then they will issue to the retail. That's what we call it, the sign one wholesaler. Or center bank issue digital currency and just let everybody go retail. There is retail CBDC. There is plus minus and what the country have. Most countries, they already have national payment system industries, yeah. then usually central bank only go to the wholesaler. This wholesaler that will di distribute the retailer. This is public partnership. But many countries do not have a national payment system industry. Okay. Usually those countries that do, uh, you know, the digitalization based on the telecommunication base, that they will go directly to the retail. 
So this is two ways to do CBDC. Issue by center bank, then you choose wholesaler, or you want to just do the retail, depending of the, the, the country. Two, three aspects that need to be confronted. One, the design, the proper design, where Indonesia will choose wholesaler. Will go. Many countries choose wholesaler, but some of them retailer, proper design. Second, of course, the connectivity, interconnectivity, interoperability, interintegration of the payment system, infrastructure, and financial market. This is the requirement. Because otherwise, you cannot distribute it, digital rupiah or digital country if the payment system and money market is not integrated. The third is technology platform. Technology platform, this is where BIS, working closely, also in the Asia, there's a number of platform technology. In Asia, there is working on the M bridge. And then there is project Dunbar and other project of the BIS and so on. Platform, the correct platform technology, which is actually the central bank and BIS working closely, what is the proper design. And this is also important, this platform, because then every country, when issues domestic CBDC, will also go, go cross-border. And this is, this is important. And last but not least, CBDC is always digitalized platform technology. At the end of the day, central bank and regulator must work together. What is the exchange rate arrangement? What is the proper you know, uh, capital flows management. What is also the cyber security? This is where the IMF play the role of global policy on exchange rate arrangement on also capital flows management and as well as also operational risk and such. This is the route to go to the CBDC that we work closely and the Indonesia presidency with the IMF, thank you IMF, with the BIS, you know, we are working closely on, on that aspect. This is where actually the route to go. In the meantime, just do financial inclusion through digitalization of the payment system, introduce QR, okay. doing the fast payment, cheap, financial literacy, empower the woman, okay. empower the okay. SME. This is what we are doing, Catherine. I know, Cecilia, you want to jump in. Yeah, no, so Perry, you, I think you, you outlined kind of uh, the variety of, of, uh, of, of uh, paths that, central, that, that the countries can take. And, and uh, that, is, uh, that is sobering. Uh, we, we will not find a solution that fits all. Uh, we will not end up on, on, uh, on, on platforms that we all agree on. Because we have to be realistic. Not all countries of the world is prepared to play well with all the other countries in the world. Mm -hmm. So there will be different solutions uh, and uh, there will be different levels of, of, of con connectivity. Um, it, it's, it's fun to talk, listen to, to some of you. Uh, you're talking about problems and I'm, I'm, I'm immediately thinking about, yeah, we have a project about, for example, offline payments. Um, and we have the issues around correspondent banking, there is AML. Uh, 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 kind of the, the monitoring of that has, has caused a lot of friction. Yeah, we have a we have a we have a, a, a technical project about that. But my bottom line here is that technolo technology can take us a great deal of the way, uh, but it's never the only. Uh, you need more. So I think in the years to come, as as me and my team and, and others who are kind of inventing and, and innovating, showcase what could be done. Uh, it's up to regulators and it's up to executive powers in countries to decide what, what should be done. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, that is the hard work. Uh, and, and I really hope that uh, we could sort of can have, a, be a little bit of give and take and it might be some short term cost for, for long term benefits in the same way as I think it could be short term costs but also long term benefits for the private sector getting into uh, a new equilibrium in this area. So but we have to get the IMF perspective in here, okay, you know, what, what can be done, what IMF can do and what they're hoping others will do, what, what's, the, what's the plan? Well we are, uh, 
we just adopted a, a digital uh, uh, currency strategy last year by our board, and we are doing uh, many things right now uh, in terms of uh, digital money. Uh, we are doing technical assistance with our members. Um, we are doing analytical work. We are working with uh, BIS, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, on some of the um, regulatory standards for crypto assets, for example. But in particular, with respect to CBDC, um, we received a request for TA, for technical assistance. We received 43 requests last year from our 43 countries. And right now, we have uh, 16 active uh, TA projects right now on CBDC. So we you know, help our members to develop their capacity to also analyze the macro financial aspect of CBDC. That is, what's the impact of CBDC on monetary policy transmission, for example, on financial stability. We also work with them on the cross-border aspect as Governor Perry and Cecilia just mentioned. That those are particularly interesting but also challenging aspects of CBDC. Uh, based on our TA projects, we see uh, two challenges, uh, mainly from our existing uh, uh, TA projects. The first challenge would be the, what uh, MD just mentioned in her speech. There is a hesitancy among some customers, some merchants, to join this ecosystem. So we need a better understanding of what's the cause, mm -hmm. what's, dri what's driving that hesitancy. One way to solve that, uh, that hesitancy, I think, relates back to our data question. That is, if we can create enough value, you know, if by joining this ecosystem, if consumer can enjoy a lot more financial services, if they can get credit, they may be willing to join the ecosystem, mm -hmm. sure. right? Exactly. The same thing for merchants, right? If they can provide more service, and if, can, if they can earn a profit, they're gonna be willing to join this ecosystem. So I think one way to solve this hesitancy is to create value by utilizing the data. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge that we see from our members is that CBDC projects require resources and skills that are not within the traditional expertise of central banks, <laughs> right? They need to design products. They need to market the products. They need to price the product. And they need to distribute the product. So this is not the traditional central bank expertise. So central bank need to find a way to fill that gap, this resource gap, this skill gap. The good news is that, you know, we have seen our members to be very creative and very innovative to try to fill that gap. You know, some of them would outsource certain aspects of this uh, development to the private sector. Some of them will have partnership with private vendors to co-develop okay. certain part of this project. Some of them will hire technical ex experts from the market to join the central bank so they can develop the core part of their, their operation internally. So there are innovative solutions to, to try to fill that gap. And we also see central banks, they learn from each other. Right. You know, central banks, like BIS, is providing a very good platform for central banks to talk to each other so they can exchange ideas and experiences. Vera, I think we've got time for one more comment here. And when, 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 you, when you hear these, all these things, and of course, you know, Cecilia just said, uh, you know, what could be done versus should be done. Uh, you know, we, we heard the pitch for the SMEs, right, and wholesale ver versus retail and all these things. I love, yeah, central banks, they have enough trouble with monetary policy these days without having to try to design uh, CBDCs, right? So Vera, when you put it all together, in, in, considering all the work you've done with inclusion and that sort of thing over the years, what do you think is, is, is the, the step, one of the steps that we need to bring to the table here to, as we wrap this up that 
I know, it's a big question. <laughs> I, I would say uh, uh, exactly what you've been saying. We need to deepen digitization because it all starts with that. Yes, we can do a lot of it also on non-digital platforms, but it is so important to have those broadband highways flowing across the continent as almost a prerequisite for getting that done. And secondly, financial literacy. Financial literacy is an important, important part of the conversation because even when we have the CBDCs, if people don't know how to use it or how to use it well, then we get into issues of cybersecurity and then it, you lose confidence in the currency even before it becomes abroad enough. Uh, Quick follow on that. Asset. Does that mean that this is also then a, a role for broader government policies? Yes, a lot more. And, and again, I think even in this area, we need public-private partnerships. When I think, for example, of the Central Bank of Mauritius, they're doing so much work on digital literacy for CBDC use, because we assume that people know how to use this or that they will know when it comes how to do it. I think we have a very good example in Africa with uh, Equity Bank and Mwangi, who grew a bank that was really a small-scale local retail bank in the hills of Kenya to a, almost a billion-dollar bank today with a lot of financial literacy. This was the private sector working with the public sector, identifying some of the constraints and talking to the public sector to say, if you fix this, I can go one step further. If you fix this, I can go one step further. And I think in that example, we can learn a lot and see how we can vulgarize this uh, financial inclusion on the continent and beyond. All right, well, unfortunately, this, the clock is striking five, so I think I, I have to uh, stop uh, and asking more questions. And I, first, I want to I start, I start by thanking our panelists. And of course, Bo Lee, Deputy Managing, Managing Director at the IMF, Cecilia Kingsley, uh, BIS Innovation Hub Head, uh, Vera Songwe, uh, Chair of the Liquidity and Sustainability Finance Committee and Co-Chair of the High Level Panel on Climate Finance at the UN, and Governor Piri Wargio, uh, Governor of the Bank of Indonesia, who spends a lot, of, a lot of his time on CBDCs. And of course, but wait, wait, I have to thank Queen Maxima, Madam Gorgieva, what a great way to start. And all of you for being here. You, uh, it's just wonderful, doesn't it feel, when you have an attentive audience who really cares about this. You're really appreciative for the time you've all spent here. And again, thank you for coming and thank you for inviting me.